Series entitled Savage Jesus. Somebody say Savage, savage. Jesus. Let me hear it with some strength. That ain't no savage way to say it. Let me hear you say Savage, savage. Jesus. Jesus. Savage Jesus. Savage Jesus. Savage Jesus. Savage Jesus. And see, the Jesus that we oftentimes hear about and study comes from a Hollywood perspective, where Jesus is often portrayed as mild and quiet. And Turn the other cheek if you get punched in the face. Love your enemy. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And see, we, we talk over and over about the lamb side of Jesus. For he's the lamb that was slain, a lamb that freely given up his life, a lamb that did not use any of his power because he was there to be sacrificed. And we wear crosses around our neck and we glorify the lamb. And that is okay and that is good. But there is a side of Christ that is very rarely it's talked about. It's very rarely dug into. It is the lion side of Christ. For the, Satan goes about as a, as, like a roaring lion. But the God we serve, the Jesus that we talk about, is the lion of Judah. He is almighty. He is all powerful. He is savage. See, it was savage Jesus that talked to Peter, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you don't know what I'm supposed to do. You can't stop me from, from taking persecution and giving my life on the cross. It was savage Jesus that told people, it's better for you to take a large rock and hang it around your neck and jump into the lake and drown. It's better for you to do that than make one of these little children fall into sin. Because I'm savage. And it's okay that y'all don't talk about this part of Christ, but it's okay because he's in him and he was a savage Jesus. See, the, the Jesus that I studied for this sermon series, he said, it's better for you to pluck out your eyes, gouge your eyes out. Guy, get them out of there. Pluck them out. Have blood everywhere. It's better for you to do that than to die with two eyes. And get thrown into the pits of hell because you could never contain what you put in front of your eyes. And over and over and over, you continue to put the most evil images in front of your eyes. The most evil text in front of your eyes. And it's better for you to gouge them out than to have two of them and get thrown into hell. This is the savage Jesus that is rarely talked about. It was savage Jesus that rolled up into a temple. He didn't like what was going on. And it was savage Jesus that got a whip and that chased them out of the temple, smacking that whip and making a scene and flipping over tables. And he was extremely angry. And we don't see Jesus ever being angry. You see Jesus as smiled and meek and never got upset. See, when the Bible says, be ye angry and sit down, we never thought that that applied to Jesus. But it is okay, Victory Community Church, to be ye angry at things that aren't going on correctly in the temple. For too long, the body of Christ has been okay with things not going right in the temple, and we just think that's how it's supposed to be. Be ye angry and sit not was the word that brought out the ultra focus, the ultra tenacity, the ultra, the ultra fierceness that is in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is what we will divulge in in this series. So when you think of savage Jesus, think of the angry Jesus. Think of the tenacious Jesus. Think of the ultra focused, fierce Jesus that would not be stopped no matter what the situation was. This is the Jesus that we will Discussed in John chapter 2, verse 13 through 22. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version, but all versions for this um, passage are about the same. John chapter 2, verse 13 through 22. Savage Jesus. 
When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jesus made a habit of going to church. Jesus didn't say, I already know the word, so I can stay here. No, even though he's Jesus Christ, he still went up to Jerusalem for the religious ceremony. Isn't that interesting? Verse 14, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, cattle, big cattle, big sheep, and doves, animals everywhere, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So Jesus turn the other cheek, Jesus. The meek shall inherit the earth, Jesus. Mouth and manner, Jesus. Jesus that wouldn't say anything, Jesus. That Jesus that we talk about ain't here because he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle, get your animals and get out of here. He scattered the coins of money changers and overturned their tables because he was savage, Jesus. Verse 16, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The zeal for the house of God can consume you and make you do things that are out of your character. Woo, that is written in Psalms by David. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus always has sly remarks. Because <laughs> yeah. he's savage, man. I'm, I'm answering y'all how I want to answer y'all. Yeah. I'm savage like that. I don't got to answer how you want me to answer. Right. They say this. What, what gives you the authority? What gives me the authority? All right. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That's what gives me the authority. Yeah. They replied, what? It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you were going to raise it in three days and the world never, uh, never understood what he was talking about. And we want to get to this later in the series where they actually mock him on the cross and saying, oh, so you could build a temple in three days, but you can't even get there from the cross. They never understood this passage. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. The temple is the body. Interesting. We'll get into that. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. The disciples recalled this scripture after he raised from the dead. And this passage then made them believe the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. All right, that is the text for today. But let us break this thing down before we get out of here, all right? Really, that's strong enough to send you on home if you were paying attention. But we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down. Let's jump back to verse number 14. Verse number 14. The job of them. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So what is going on here? Why are there cattle? Not just like one cattle, it's plural. You come to church. Imagine coming into church and it's a flock of cattle here. It's a flock of sheep here. And Instead of T and some doing this, they exchange the money. Like, what are they doing? Why are there so many cattle here? All right, so let's break this down. Why were there so many cattle here? So, Passover, you were coming off for a sacrifice. All right? And just like Dan Snyder from the Washington Commanders, right? You can go to Food Lion right now and you can get a pack of hot dogs for $4.99. $3.99 is maybe you get the Food Lion brand, right? <laughs> and you can go home and you can make probably eight hot dogs for $3.99 and feed your whole family and have a good time, especially if you grill them over charcoal. Amen? Amen. So you pay $3.99 for eight hot dogs because that's what you're supposed to pay. But if you go to Dan Snyder's Washington Commander house, he's going to charge you $11.99 for one hot dog. He's price gouging the people. And this is why everybody gets Dan, Dan Snyder. $11.99 for a hot dog and chips, and I got a family of four and I'm sixty dollars. <laughs> How many hot dogs could I have bought for sixty dollars? Well, I just went to food lines. <laughs> oh, case. <laughs> and this was what was going on. People would come from all over the region to Jerusalem for the Passover, and if you live thirty miles away, 
you live 35 miles away. You cannot bring your cattle with you for the sacrifice. So what do you say? I can't bring him 50 miles, 100 miles to at least take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I gotta feed him, give him water, he all big, he pooping everywhere, I can't bring him here. So I'm going to buy my cattle when I get to the temple. And so when they first set up the ministry, it was very good. It, it helped people who were taking pilgrimages buy cattle so that they could give a sacrifice. They could fill a cart. They could, they could get their sins cleansed. It was great until they started to price gouge. And normally, a, normally a sheep would cost you, let's just use our terms, let's say $100. But at the temple, you got to pay $8 for a cattle. And you need to buy this cattle because you got to do your sacrifice, right? Yeah. So they are making money hand over fishing. It is a great thing. And the priests are getting paid. And the vendors are getting paid. And the government is getting paid. And everybody is getting paid. And everybody is getting money. And it's all good. And nobody who was coming to worship has a problem with it. Nobody opened up their mouths. Nobody spoke up and said, this ain't how our church is supposed to be. We just come and say, if it ain't impacting me, I'm going to take a seat and keep it moving. I'm not going to pick up this trash because it ain't impacting me. I'm not going to say something to them. I'll have a full conversation in the hallway while the preacher is preaching because it ain't impacting me. I get the word. And we come in and we take our seats. And that's what was going on. And they were exchanging money. The TSM over here exchanging money. Why are they exchanging money? Because when when you would come to purchase your cattle, they would only take Jewish, Jewish coins, Jewish currency. So you coming from all over the place, you got US currency. So I gotta come and I gotta exchange my money to get Jewish currency. When I'm supposed to give you $1, and I'm supposed to get back 10 coins, instead I'm giving you $1, you can give me back one coin. Mm. So they get me here because I didn't get the right exchange rate and then they get me when I got to buy the cattle. So I'm all, I, I'm not in a heart of worship now. And I'm furious. Ah, oh, so they interrupted the spirit of God. Be ye angry and sin not. So that's what's going on in verse 14. Sometimes we got to understand what's going on so that we can apply it to our lives. And the whole thing is, it started out well. That ministry, those two ministries are exactly what the church needed. Yeah. We need to service people that are coming from miles away. We need to have a place where they can exchange currency. Everything started out good until money ruined it. I wonder how many pastors started out good until money ruined them. I wonder how many believers started out good working diligently in the church until somebody said, you don't even get paid to do that. What you mad for? You don't even get paid to do that. Why are you taking all that from the pastors? You don't even get paid to do that. Why are you going to all these meetings? And they started out doing good until money ruined it. We talk about the love of money being the root of all evil. Well, we see it here again in the text. And you look at these vendors selling these goods to make money. What are they doing? They're making money for their family. They are putting milk in their baby's mouths. They are having money so their kids can go to the doctors. Shouldn't they come to church and better their lives? Why is Christ so upset? They're just better than their lives. And many come to church with the sole reason that I got to better my life. I'm having rough financial situations. I got to better my life. So maybe if I get a hold of this word, my finances can change and I can be better. I got to better my life because I don't like how I'm living. I'm coming so I can better my life. And when you come to church for the purpose of bettering your life, you're actually missing the boat. Yeah. Let me say that again. When you come to church for the sole purpose of bettering your life, you're actually missing the boat. Yeah. Prove it, friends. Sure, Matthew 6.33, you don't got to turn there. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have to come to church with, I got to get out of my life. No, no, come to get closer to God first. Come to worship God. Don't miss worship. Come to worship your God. Come to learn about God. Come to grow closer to God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then he will better your life, and he will add these things to you. Come with the heart of worship. Come with the heart to learn. 
comes to heart to receive the word of God and when you seek to serve the kingdom of God, he will add those things to you. Verse 15. And this is the verse that is, I could not, I, I used to try show, to show a video to accompany the text. I couldn't show a video because they skipped this part. And it really upset me that they didn't get this right. So he made a whip out of cords. So picture this. Jesus comes to church. He sees Rodney and Christ gouging. He sees the priest okay with it. He sees the TSM exchange of money. And he sees all of this and he is hot man. He is furious. What does he do? He sits down and he starts to make a whip. Isn't it wild? He sits down and he starts working with his hands, making a cord, making a whip, and building things strategically. And his disciples have got to be thinking, what in the world is going on? We just got the Passover. We're ready to do this thing. Are you sitting down making a whip? And what was he doing? He was showing you how to be angry and sin now. Because most of us, when we're angry, we just lash out. We just lash out. No thought around it. No, no reasoning. No strategy. I'm just grabbing this belt and I'm about to beat somebody because I'm wilding out. Because I'm mad. And we thinking the kids are supposed to learn from seeing you act like a fool? To see you lose your mind and lose your temper and go all out? When if you had taught them before what not to do, they would not have done it? And if you were monitoring their behavior, they wouldn't have got to that point? But since they were left to their own devices, doing whatever, they do what kids do, and then we lose our mind. <laughs> and, and he teaches us how to be angry and sit down. That he sits down and he thinks about what he's going to do. He's thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to accomplish it? Which way am I going to drive him out of the town? How am I going to do this but also show love and grace? Because in my father's day, before I hit the earth, if there was any misconduct in the temple, they would have been killed. But now I'm actually bringing grace to the situation. They just don't understand it. Because really their life should be required. But I'm still going to correct it, but I'm grace. So I'm going to correct it, but I'm going to be loving. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit and correct it. But I got to think all this out. I got to figure it out. Because people who are doing something of God, they're focused and they're strategic. They're not emotionally led. So he had to sit down and get his thoughts together and not be emotionally led. Uh, emotionally led because even Christ had to deal with emotions. Amen. Because this is his father's house that they messing up. And we don't look at church as my father's house. I got to really honor and reverence and respect this thing. But he looked at it as this is my father's house and it hurt him to his heart. But he didn't go all out. He sat down and he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep, both cattle, scattered the coins of money, changers and overturn their tables. Verse 16. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And when I read this verse and I let it settle in my heart and I realized what the picture that was going on here, and Jesus is literally running people out of the church. He's, he's, he's running people out of the church. And we think, shouldn't this be the other way around if you're Jesus, the Son of God? Shouldn't you be in the streets with some whip running people into the church? <laughs> Wouldn't that be what you would think that the Son of God would do? Shouldn't you have a whip and be in the streets running people into the church? But that's not what he did. And what can we learn from this church? That perhaps the body of Christ must cleanse internally. Yeah. It's not worried so much about people that aren't in the church. We must cleanse internally. We must get ourselves together. We must get our, ourselves right. We must clean our temple of all of the nonsense that's going on before we can worry about bringing the world in. 
Because God is not going to send the world into a place that's full of chaos and turmoil and backbiting and gossiping and angry people and angry church folks and hurt church folks and angry mad people all over the place. No, 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 no. That's good. He said, first clean my temple out before we can worry about bringing those in. His focus was different than our focus. All over the world, we focus on bringing them in. He said, no, 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 no. Focus on cleaning up first. Verse 18. Then the Jews responded to him. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Savage response. There you go. See, she's with me. Savage response. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And this was one of the most powerful kind of like chest out responses. I thought he was supposed to be humble, but this is humble. See, people have a wrong impression of what humble is. That means that you can't speak up for yourself. That's right. That's right. And tell the enemy that if you destroy this temple in three days, don't think that it's going to stay destroyed because I'm going to build it right back up. And it's, it's odd how God gives you weird scriptures to help you through situations. And it was this scripture here that really helped me through the pandemic. That if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up again in three days. And the whole time I'm thinking, two years of having church clothes. Like, what if we go back? And it's kind of destroyed. And I'm back to preaching to my wife and family and my mother and maybe one other family. And they kind of got destroyed from the pandemic. And whenever those thoughts were in my mind, this scripture came. That it, it doesn't matter because if it's destroyed, we're going to build it right back up. So I'm not going to quit. I'm going to get on this zoom and I'm going to preach my tail off. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to go into this open arena and I'm going to give it everything I got because if it's destroyed, it doesn't matter. We can build it right back up. And this is the resurrection power of Christ that is in you. Stop being fearful of things that I might get destroyed, so I'm not going to take the chance. I might fall into the water, so I'm going to stay on the boat. I'm not going to walk. Because you gotta, it's, it, it's, you gotta take a chance Amen. to get off that boat. Yeah. And many of us, we stay sick because I'm afraid to take a chance because what if I lose? And what if the business don't work? And what if this happens? And what if I foreclose? I'm gonna stay in my apartment. You gotta get off that boat and take a chance and know that if I fall, he's gonna build me up in three days. It's gonna be all right. This is, a, this is the resurrection power of Christ that he was putting on the scene and they just didn't understand. That my people don't have to worry about failing because whatever they lose, and the devil took that for me, the enemy stole. Whatever is stolen from you can be built back up in three days. If you get a hold of this word, stop being mad about things that have left you and people who have got out your life and you walk out of your life. Stop being mad about things that have left you and people who have got out your life and walked out your life and they hurt me and they left me. Whatever you have lost can be built back up. Stop being mad about things that have left you and people who have got out your life and walked out your life and they hurt me and they left me. Whatever you have lost can be built back up. If you get a hold of this word. Hallelujah. Jesus. Um, he ain't turned on the cheek there. He got in front of a group of religious leaders after he then messed up their whole business plan. <laughs> Knocked over their tables. You know how much money they would lose if I flip over their table? They got two million they exchange in money. Lost all their money. Drove their cattle out. We drive cattle out. They scurry. They go everywhere. You, you can't even get them back. They gone. They running. Wreck everything up. Destroyed that temple and then had the nerve to say, when they say, What gives you the authority? They say, What gives me the authority is the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection power of God that lives in the inside of me. What gives you the authority to preach the resurrection power of Christ that lives inside of me? What gives you the authority to move mountains in the spirit? The resurrection power of Christ that lives inside of me. What gives you the authority to do that thing? The resurrection power of Christ. And he said it with a, I know he said it with a chest out there. Yes. What gives me the authority? If you tear this temple down in three days, I'm going to build it back up. That's what gives me the authority. In conclusion, verse number 15. Back to 15. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle the scattered, 
and scattered the coins of money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So he told us in three days, I will raise up this temple. And they thought he was talking about the building. And we read the text, and he cleans out the building. So we can see it as cleaning out the building, but we can also realize that the temple is us. Yes. Yes. Ooh. Yes. 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 Ooh. Yes. We are the temple. Amen. You don't got to turn to it, but 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, if you take your notes, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit yes. who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. No. You were bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your body because your body is a temple of God. It is not your own. So now that we're looking at it from a different perspective because he cleaned out the temple, but perhaps the word cleans out my temple. And perhaps the word gets a whip. And this is why we come to church. Because the whip... Runs things. Woo! It runs. It runs things out. It runs things out, and we can't run from the word of God. We got to sit in the word of God because we got things enough that need to be ran out. We got anger enough that need to be ran. I, I wish somebody said out. We got pride enough that need to be ran. We got greed enough that need to be ran. We got selfishness in us that need to be ran out. We got fear in us that need to be ran out. We got addictions in us that need to be ran We got alcohol in us that need to be ran We got worldly friends that corrupt us that need to be ran We got problems that need to be ran need to be ran out. And when you come and you sit in the presence of God and you get that word in you over and over and over and over again, you got no choice but to get cleaned up on the inside. To have those things that you thought were going to be with you your whole life cleaned up on the inside. So you ask those men who were posted up selling cattle, who were exchanging money, how long y'all going to be here? They would say, we ain't never leaving. You see how much money we making? You see how many cattle we selling? We ain't never leaving. And guess what? When I'm too old to do it, my son right here with me, he gonna do it. This curse goes from generation to generation. We ain't never leaving. That's what they were saying. You were at them until the word got a hold of them. Until the word walked in. Until the word got angry. Until the word got savage on them. And he said, get out of my house. Fair, get out of my house. It drives out evil beings that they're going to set up for generation after generation and corrupt me and corrupt my daughter and corrupt my son and corrupt my newborn and go from generation to worse. No, 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 no. And this is why the fight for many to even get in to hear the word. And they feel like they got to move earth and they got to cancel plans and everybody wants them to do something on Sunday because the enemy knows that you're just sitting under that word. It's going to clean up everything on the inside. And this is the start, part one of the series we are calling Savage Jesus. You can stand on your feet and give him some praise. For he is Savage Jesus. He is the Lion of Judah. He is almighty. He is all powerful. He does have the power to destroy. Anything in your life that does not belong there. For all those that have lost something, fear not. For anything that you have lost can be rebuilt in three days if you tap into this word. For this word has the power to restore. 
His word has the power to redeem. His word has the power to resurrect your life. That your life is not over. That the best is yet to come. That God has a plan for you. That God has not given up on you. As we worship, the altar is open. If anyone needs prayer for any situation. will be 
resurrected like only you can, Lord God. For you are close to the brokenhearted. And you save those that are crushed in spirit, Lord God. So all those that enter crushed, I thank you that they are not leaving that way. That they will see themselves as you see them, as mighty warriors, as victorious, as the head and not the tail, as above and not beneath, as inventors and not those that just consume products, as business owners and not those that just work for businesses. For you have made your people the head and not the tail, and I pray that we walk in our full capacity. I thank you that this is the week of divine interactions. That doors are open. That doors that look shiny and perfect for us are closed in our face. And it may hurt at the moment, but it is for our own good. And we thank you for the closed doors that so happen this week. That we will not stumble and fall. That we will not walk into traps. That you see two steps, three steps, ten steps ahead. And you are preparing the way for your people. I thank you that your people are blessed. That we are victorious and not victims. That we are above and not beneath. That we will leave this place with joy in our hearts. And let the blessed people of God shout, Amen. Amen.